Welcome to our college class, uh, CSE 201. Uh, we're going to be starting where we left off last time on uh, the evolution theory. I teach on creation and evolution all over the world and want to set the record straight that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate and the evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of planet Earth. We left off last time talking about how some people believe, have, have taught and are still teaching, that man can become God. And they got this idea from Satan in the Garden of Eden. Kenneth Hagin said, The believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. The believer is called Christ. That's who we are. We're Christ. Now the Bible warned us, warns us to be careful about being carried away with divers doctrines and things that are just plain, this is just plain crazy, okay? This is not correct. You're not Christ, okay? <laughs> the job's not available and you couldn't handle it if you had it. Satan is the one who wants to be God. Isaiah chapter 14 is just an amazing chapter about the fall of Lucifer. Uh, thou, talking about Lucifer quite obviously, if you read Isaiah chapter 14, has said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. It's interesting. These steps, these five times where he says, I will, I will, I will, each of them gets a little more bold. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And this is what pride and ego nearly always does to people, you know. They get a little bit and they want a little bit more, you know. And then, oh wow, hey, I'm gonna, let's just go all the way to the top, you know. Let's just go all the way. Lucifer clearly here is stating that he wants to become like the Most High. Apparently, even he knows he cannot become the Most High, but he wants to be like the Most High. And Satan always uses lies. The Bible says he's a liar and the father of it. In John, I believe it's chapter 14, Jesus said, uh, he's a liar, you're of your father the devil, he's a liar and he's the father of it. All lies come from him, apparently, according to Scripture. So, he wants to be like the Most High. Uh, in Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over, over all the earth and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. God, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. We are made in the image of God. Lucifer wants to be like God, <clears throat> but uh, he can't do that. He can't affect God. But, and so he's very angry at God, apparently, from the various verses you read in Scripture. And he wants to do something to get back at God, is the best I can figure out on this whole thing. By the way, if you have any comments, feel free to say something or you know, raise your hand and let's just have a discussion on this. But my understanding of this is Lucifer, probably a hundred years after the creation, sinned and said, I want to be God. I was taught as a young Christian with my Schofield reference edition, the old Schofield reference edition, you know, with the proper names index. <laughs> uh, the, and in all the Schofield editions, they teach that, you know, Satan fell before verse 2, Genesis 1, 2, the gap theory. How many have ever heard of the gap theory before? Okay. We'll get into that much later here, probably in about 12 years at the rate we're going. But uh, the idea that Lucifer fell before the six days of creation is ludicrous, cannot possibly be true. We've got a little book we put out called The Gap Theory, dealing with that very subject. It is, in my opinion, one of the most dangerous heresies to hit the church in the last 200 years because that is it's unscriptural. That's, that's what makes it a heresy. But uh, that's what neutralized Christian resistance to the evolution theory when it came out, you know, 30 years later. So we're made in God's image. Satan wants to be God. And so it really, if you look at all the scriptures together, as we will later through this course, Lucifer probably fell from heaven about 100 years Certainly not during the six day week, during the six day creation week, or, or even shortly thereafter. I think he got jealous of Adam and Eve's fellowship with God, and said, "You know, they ought to be worshiping me." You can read Ezekiel 28 when we get to that, where he talks about, you know, Lucifer's heart was lifted up because of his pride, because of his wisdom, because of his power, because of his riches. Uh, you know, beauty, beauty, wisdom, riches, and power corrupt most people. You know, there are very few of the super rich, you know, beautiful movie star type people that have a sweet, humble, godly spirit. It just nearly always ruins them, you know. God almost always has to take the weak things of this world to confound the wise, you know. It's what he does. First Corinthians chapter 1 talks about that. But 
we are made in God's image. Satan wants to be God. He can't be God, so he's angry. And there's been a war going on for 6,000 years, which we'll get into later. But he wants to destroy God's creation. You know, if you ever wonder, why does Satan hate me? Why does he do these things? Well, he didn't even, you say, I don't even know him. Oh, he knows you, and you represent God to him. So he just simply wants to destroy your life. It's interesting. If he knows he can't destroy your soul, if you're saved, he can't get your soul. He can still get your life. Jesus Christ said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save men's lives. A lot of people, their soul is saved and their life is still lost. That's the tragedy, I guess, of a person getting saved when they're 80 years old. I mean, it's great. I'm glad they got saved. You know, but their whole life is wasted. I'd much rather see a seven-year-old get saved. That's awesome. Now you've got a whole lifetime ahead of you, you know, to do something for God with your life. I see people all the time, they come to me at seminar and say, hey, I got saved watching your tapes. You know, some 10-year-old kid will come up. I say, man, that's awesome. Look, I was 16 when I got saved. You got a six-year head start on me. You better do a whole lot more for God than I ever did. And that's the truth. All I can be is the launching pad and to send somebody higher. I want my three kids to do much more for God than I have ever done. That's for sure. I should be able to bring them up to where I'm at and then send them on from there. That's what a teacher does. You know, if you, if you want to learn everything in the world on your own, you're going to be an extremely old man by the time you know much of anything, okay? You might as well take what somebody else has already learned and you know, it took them 20 years to learn how to do that. Okay, you can learn it in 20 minutes and then you're way ahead from there. You want to reinvent every single computer component that's in here? No, let's just go ahead and take some of the parts that other people have already made and put them together. That's just common sense. But anyway, it appears that Lucifer fell about 100 years after the creation and he, he wants to destroy God. He wants to get back at God. So there's been a, year, a war going on for 6,000 years with Lucifer trying to destroy God's creation. Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, and often enough, the people will believe it. Now, I have had people criticize me for using this quote. Eric, I don't know if you have or not, but they say, Hitler never said that. I can't find exactly where he said that. I read a lot of books about Hitler and by Hitler, but uh, <clears throat> certainly his, his propaganda uh, minister, Goebbels, uh, said that. Um, but that was the concept. The thinking in Germany was, this is a big lie, a big lie. Let's just keep telling it over and over and over, and everybody will believe it. Um, one of the fascinating books I just read here recently was uh, called The Pink Swastika. Well, in The Pink Swastika, they talk about how 90% of Hitler's leaders in the, in the SS were queer. They were gay, homosexual. And it's a fascinating to show you, because you wonder, how can somebody be so ferocious, so, so heartless? Well, read Romans chapter 1. It's a direct descent, you know, from they don't want to believe God leads right into homosexuality. Romans chapter 1 shows it all the way down. But Hitler, it, it just put things together for me, and I read a lot on Hitler and been there a couple times to Germany, but it just put it more in perspective, like, wow, this is why. This is how they could do that. I remember reading a story one time of one of the SS guards, you know, seeing this lady and this old man walking down the street, and uh, the guard said, <clears throat> let me see your papers, please, and showed the papers, and he said, what's wrong with your, this man here? She said, oh, that's my father. He's blind. And the guard said, oh, I'm sorry to hear about that. Pulled out his pistol, <laughs> shot the guy, put his pistol back, and said, you have a good night. You know, just absolutely no conscience, because after all, if you're blind, you're no longer useful to society, so I might as well get rid of you. That was the thinking, okay? Anyway, Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, enough, he also said, people are more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. And I think evolution has got to be the biggest lie, <laughs> the dumbest lie ever. Can you imagine how bad these people are going to feel after this life is over and they die? <clears throat> if they believed in evolution all their life, they're going to be in hell forever. Thinking about how could I have been so stupid? How many people right now are sitting in prison cells, been there sometimes for months or years, thinking, why did I do that? How could I have been so dumb? How I many of you have ever done something that you've, maybe you're still thinking about it. Well, how could I have been so dumb as to do that, you know? I got different scars on my body. I look at it and say, why, why did I do that? <laughs> what was I thinking? I like that show on TV, you know, what were they thinking? <laughs> you see people do things like, have you thought about what this, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. But Satan says, or Lucifer says, I'm going to tell a big lie and get people to believe it. 
People are going to sit in hell for, forever thinking, how could I have possibly believed such a dumb idea that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago? The evidence was all around me. It was overwhelming. And I just didn't want to look at it. The Bible says they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So God gives them up. The Bible says he, he sends them delusion. The problem starts with them. I had an atheist call into the program, radio program we do, and he said, well, it sounds like it's God's fault if somebody doesn't believe, if God sends them delusion. I said, no, 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 the problem starts with the person. The person doesn't want to believe, and then God sends them delusion. People say, well, you know, God's not fair because he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, you better read that very carefully, okay? If you put a lump of clay and a stick of butter out on the sidewalk in the hot sun, the sun will harden the clay and soften the butter. Same sun, different reactions. How you react to what happens in your life is totally up to you. You can have tragedy strike your life and you can decide to get mad at God or you can decide to say, well, praise God, you're in charge. That's what happened to Job. Powerful lesson there in Job. Everything went wrong. All ten of his kids died. Same time. Lost everything. Lost his health. His wife turned on him. He says, well, the Lord gave, the Lord took it away. Okay. That's your decision. Now, Pharaoh chose the opposite. Every time something bad happens, I'm going to get God next time, you know. I'm going to get that Moses. <laughs> that was not God doing that. So I guess you could say God hardened his heart by the same time you could say the sun hardened the clay. You could say the sun hardened the clay, but it's actually in the clay's nature because the same sun will soften the butter. So our job, and I do this dozens of times every week, I say, Lord, give me a soften my heart. Because, Lord, I'm getting hard. This is bothering me. Lord, I want you to soften my heart. It's our job to keep our heart soft, okay? If take, somebody takes some clay and they make pottery out of it, make a vase or something, and they bake it in the oven and it gets really hard, and they say, oh, I want to I change my mind. I want it to be something else. Keith, your brother Heath does a lot with pottery and stuff. Well, once you make something into pottery, if you change your mind and want to make it to something else, you only have one choice. You have to crush it and grind it to powder, add water, and start all over. Sometimes some people's heart gets so hard, God has to crush them to reshape them. I'd much rather keep a soft heart so he doesn't have to crush me and reshape me into something else. So you just watch as you go through life and make sure you don't uh, get that hard heart you know, where God has to <laughs> crush you. Uh, you can see people's attitude, you know. How many, of you ever, how many of you have children and you've had to spank them and you saw them when they changed and softened their heart? And you can tell when they repent, can't you? We had a kindergarten kid. I was principal at a Christian school and the uh, teacher brought the kid in and said, Mr. Hovind, this is Kenny. And he was, uh, when I was gone out of the class for a while, the other kid said he was saying bad words. So I said, thank you, ma'am. I'll take care of it. I said, I said, Kenny, did you say those words? He said, no, I didn't say those words. They're lying about me. So I called in one of the students out of the class. You know, these are all kindergartners. I said, you know, Susie, did Kenny say those words? Oh, yeah. Said, oh, your eyes get this big. Yeah, he said, you know. I said, Kenny. So she went out. I said, Kenny, did you say those bad words? No, I didn't say them. They're lying about me. So I called in about nine witnesses out of the class. Finally, I said, Kenny, I love you very much. You know that. He said, yeah, Mr. Hovind, I know. I said, Kenny, I'm your best friend. But I think you're lying. They're not all lying. He said, no, Mr. Hovind, they're all lying. I said, Kenny, I don't believe you. I've called your dad. He said, give you a spanking. He said, Mr. Hovind, they're all lying. I said, Kenny, bend over, grab your knees. Got the school paddle, you know, and whap. He got up. Ah, I said, they're lying, they're lying. I said, Kenny, bend over, grab your knees. Whap. After about five swats, you could see an instant change in his heart. He turned around hugged my leg and said, I'm so sorry, Mr. Hovind, I was lying. They are all telling the truth. I did say those words, you know. His heart, something was, I wasn't trying to break his bottom or break his back. I was trying to break his spirit. Eric, you got a couple of kids that you know exactly what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> uh, Satan uh, is a liar, and Hitler ta certainly taught this concept. You just keep telling the big lie, long enough, loud enough, off people will believe it. Doesn't matter how big the lie is. And these people are going to sit in hell forever. And the Bible says, after, they, after Satan's been in hell for a thousand years, he's going to be released. And guess what? He still hasn't learned. One of the most amazing verses in the Bible to me is in the book of Revelation, 
where it says when God's sending all these plagues on the people, you know, he's trying to get them to repent. You know, the sea turns to blood and all kinds of bad things are happening on the planet. And then it says there was a, a plague of a hailstone. It says every stone about the weight of a talent. Well, a talent's about 100 pounds. It says they have this hailstone where they have 100 pound stones falling out of the sky. We had a hailstorm here last year. Remember that when it dented all the metal roofs and broke through the plastic uh, skylights and stuff like that? I mean, those hail were, what, two and a quarter inches, I think, you know. But they still, you know, didn't weigh a quarter pound, probably. But then after this, it says, <laughs> I was reading this, and I, I just set my Bible down. I said, you got to be kidding. It says, that there was a, the hail fell from heaven, about every stone about the weight of a talent. And then it says, and the people cursed God because of the hail. How can you do anything after being hit on the head with a 100-pound stone, you know, let alone curse God? But they just still don't get it. They don't get it. And um, there are some people that it doesn't matter what happens to them, they're not going to get it. That's why God gives very clear commands for some people just simply have to be executed for the good of society. We'll get into capital punishment some other time, but I'll tell you what, capital punishment is essential if you're going to have a decent society. Some people just have to be killed. Somebody said, uh, what about Gacy? John, I think it was John Gacy got converted in prison, I believe is the one. I don't know, the guy who killed and, you know, raped and murdered 30-some 30 30 boys, you know, and put them in his, buried him in his basement, you know. Uh, he might have got converted in prison. That's great. If he got saved, that's wonderful. Honestly, I'm for that, okay? I hope he, does. I hope he did. But he still should be executed. For multiple reasons for the good of society, so the next person thinks long and hard before they do that, okay? And for this closure for those parents. There's got to be a closure. God knows human nature. He designed it, and He put the rules in the Bible very clearly and simply. Here's the way you're supposed to do it if you want a good society. And when a person commits certain crimes and they're executed, the victim's family can say, wow, it's closed. Have you ever watched a movie where the bad guy finally gets shot at the end and you, that something inside of you says, wow, he deserved that, didn't he? And that's just human nature. You don't have to gloat in it, but it's true. Some people, just, they deserve it. They ought to be killed for the good of society. For their good, they ought to be killed. It's for their own good, okay? And certainly for society's good and for the victim's good. We can go off on that a long time. But, I've got two older brothers. Uh, Ross is the one that led me to Christ. He's coming down next week. Uh, he's the one in the red coat there. Uh, and then my brother Mark, he lives in Lost Wages, Nevada, and he's an engineer, uh, works out there. And my little sister Lynn is in Seattle, Washington area. She's a hairdresser and uh, been there for years and years. Loves Seattle area, will never move. She says she's going to die there. And, uh, but my two older brothers uh, were <laughs> a little bit hard on me. I was four years behind. You know, mom had two kids right in a row, and then four years later, here comes Kent. And she was hoping for a girl, and I always felt, you know, like she didn't really love me. She wanted a girl, you know, so she finally got my sister. But uh, third child. My, when I was about six, I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois, on Willow Court, down on, uh, in Twin Oaks subdivision. Who cares? But uh, the house we were living in, was very, actually, actually, I was surprised when I went back to see it, you know. It's a 900 square feet. There are four kids growing up in this house, 900 square feet, you know, about the size of this room. Uh, it was really surprising. I bet at the time I thought it was huge. How many of you know that? what I'm talking about? Same experience. You go back and see something. Boy, that was, it's got a lot smaller, hadn't it? You know? But uh, the, I was running in for breakfast one morning, nine, uh, six years old, in uh, Twin Oaks, uh, their subdivision, East Peoria, Illinois. And I was the first one there. And so I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal because there was a lot of competition with my two older brothers, you know. Uh, boy, if there's just enough food to go around, I would be the last one, you know, to get it. I go to the cooks at the kitchen all the time when I go over there to church for supper, you know, and I'll say, uh, just give me the crumbs. I like the crumbs. I was the third child. That's all I ever got anyway, and I learned to like it, you know. Uh, you're the oldest, Kevin, in yours? Oldest boy, yes. Oldest boy. So, you know, you get the good stuff then, right? You can shove the rest out of the way. So, anyway, I got the last banana. A few minutes later, my two big brothers came in. And they said, hey, Ken, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. Well, how many of you have got an older brother or sister? You know what I'm talking about then. Well, they wanted my banana, and I knew it. It was quite obvious they wanted my banana, but they weren't going to ask for it, of course, or beg for it. Big brothers don't beg little brothers for anything. My brother Ross has two, uh, <laughs> had two boys, Chad and Ryan, 
Uh, they lived right next to me in East Peoria, Illinois, when we lived out in Groveland, actually. My brother taught his kids, you know, if you have only one candy bar and I tell you to share it, the oldest one divides it and the youngest one picks which piece he wants. Solves all the problems. My brother thought, you know, my brother's quite the teacher, you know, I said, well, look at what a good teacher I am, I've solved this problem, you know, oldest one divides it, youngest one chooses which piece. So, of course, the oldest one, Chad, who is, by the way, Dr. Wackenhut on the movie we show here, you know, <laughs> then our Dinosaur Adventure Life. He's always real careful to try to get it exactly even because he knows if it's not even, he's going to lose out, you know. So one time he's dividing the Snickers bar, you know, breaks it in half, and one piece is quite obviously bigger than the rest of them. He says, there, now they're even. Which one do you want? <laughs> of course, little Ryan never did catch on. Oh, they look the same to me. I'll take this one. Okay, <laughs> good. But if you've got older brothers, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, my, my brothers, they wanted my banana, but they weren't about to beg for it. So one of them, I think it was Mark, I don't remember, one of them said, Hey, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. And I often, in my seminar, I tell the story, you know, about how, uh, uh, you know, the brain doesn't start growing until kids are 18 to 20. Uh, but I said, no, how are bananas made? And they said, what, and any parent can understand that what I'm talking about there. Uh, they said, well, down in South America, there are spiders that live up in the trees. And when they die, all their legs fold up and mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs. And a banana is nothing but moldy spider legs. And I said, of course, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana. And they said, oh, no, brother, we're not lying. Cut it in half and look in the middle. You can still see the black spots where his legs were. And, of course, I cut it in half, and sure enough, there's those spots in there, you know. And I really, as far as I remember, don't, did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. I was terrified of bananas. Of course, they never told me the truth, and they did get my banana that day, by the way. And for the next three years, they got any extra bananas that they were around the house. And, of course, my mom wondered, you know, what happened? How come you don't like bananas anymore? What happened, son? Because she never asked me, and I never volunteered, you know. Well, mom, I don't want to eat no spider legs. It's surprising how many things like that kids believe. And you've got to be careful what you teach kids, because they're going to believe it. First graders especially believe everything you tell them. And you've got to be real cautious what you teach them. Some, how many of you have ever believed something for a long time that was dumb and finally found out, wow, I got lied to, you know. <laughs> That's not true. Um, the technique they used, though, was mixing truth and error. By seeing the black spots in the banana, it's true there's black spots in there. You've got to let it sit in the, in the you know, air for a few seconds, but it's not true that they're moldy spider legs. That's the technique that's used in many, many things. That's how you get people to believe a lie. Satan comes out with the lies all the time, and he does it with the exact same technique. You know, if you're going to make a counterfeit $20 bill, you don't put Mickey Mouse's picture on there. You want to get it as close as possible to the real thing. Somebody, uh, I heard somebody on a, in a read it in a book or saw it in a, heard it in a sermon, I don't remember, just recently, about within the last six months or so. It was so powerful. He said there are three kinds of lies. You want to write this one down. This is incredible. Three kinds of lies. There's the $3 bill lie. It's obvious to everybody this thing's fake. There's no such thing, except during the Civil War there was a $3 bill. But in our modern you know, economics, economic, economics there's, there is no $3 bill. So the $3 bill lie is one that's obviously easy to spot. Secondly, there's the counterfeit $20 bill lie. Somebody tried to make it look like the real thing, and it's not. Now, sometimes those are really tough to catch. Sometimes they're pretty easy to catch, you know, but sometimes they're pretty tough. I mean, if a bank clerk is looking through a stack of 20s or 50s or 100s and they find nine in a row that have the exact same serial number, it's time to say, uh... <laughs> Most of these are, if not all of them, are counterfeit, okay? Something's wrong here. But the third kind of, by the way, the second kind of lie is very close to the truth, but it's not the truth. The third kind is by far the most dangerous. That's the real $20 bill lie. That's not really money, is it? Federal Reserve notes. I read that and I just, it just struck home. I said, wow, that is so true. The real $20 bill lie is the lie that everybody thinks is genuine. Everybody accepts it. Wow, look, that's, would you want 20 bucks? Sure, here you go. And they accept it as the real thing. But it's not. It's a lie. So the three kinds of lies, the $3 bill lie, the counterfeit 20, and the real 20.
that is universally accepted, just you got to always be watching, that maybe what everybody accepts as truth is not truth. I would say that would certainly apply to things like the Catholic Church. There are many Catholics that really honestly think, you know, hey, this is the real, this is real Christianity. Uh, no, it's not. You better study your Bible compared to what your church teaches. But rat poison, the illustration we use in our seminar about rat poison is 99%, 99.995% good food, good for the rat, and only 0.005% poison. It's this poison that kills you, kills the rat. Uh, but by, by mixing two things together, they really don't belong together. They can successfully, you know, kill the rodent. Um, that is how Satan is. He will often mix his lies with a lot of truth. Like when Satan came to Jesus on the mount after he'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry and tired and Satan came and every time he came he quoted Bible verses, didn't he? Satan said, hey, why don't you cast yourself down? It's written, the angels will, you know, bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Well, it's true, it says that, but he never quotes the whole verse. He always picks and chooses just little parts of it, you know. You can, you can make the Bible say an awful lot of things if you want to do that. There was one guy who was real discouraged one day. He said, I'm going to kill myself. He said, but before I kill myself, I'm going to see what the Bible says. Opens up his Bible and it says, Judas went out and hanged himself. He said, oh, I don't want that verse. He said, let me try again. Open up the Bible and says, go ye therefore. Oh, no, what thou doest. No, yeah, go ye therefore and do likewise. He said, oh, I don't want that verse. He closed it again, opened it up and said, what thou doest, do quickly, you know. So the Bible says, go quickly, kill yourself. It, no, it doesn't say that. They pick a verse here and a verse there. Uh, Jonathan, the radio program we do, you know, the one guy calls in. He's always trying to twist our words just a little bit to get us to say something. We had a 10-minute conversation yesterday. He said, no, 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 that's not what we said. That's not our position. For 30 minutes, was it on? Yeah. 30 minutes, yeah. On our radio program on truthradio.com. Do they archive those, Truth Radio? Okay. You can go listen to those if you'd like. But... Uh, twisting or mixing just a little bit of poison. If I gave you a bottle of water and said, here, before I give you this water, I'm just going to put in two drops of arsenic, you know, or strychnine. You say, that's poison. No, the water's fine. Yeah, the water's fine, but there's poison mixed with it. And the textbooks are fine, but there's some poison mixed with them. And I use the illustration in the seminar. We don't need to go through all that now about how Marlboro cigarettes always mixes cowboys in with advertising for Marlboro. What do the cowboys have to do with Marlboro? But people learn to associate that. And you'd be surprised how many seventh grade kids are going out after school, smoking behind the barn or something, thinking, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> Where'd they get this idea? From the advertising. You know, I'm cool, I'm macho. You know, movie stars will get paid an awful lot of money by companies just so they will wear a particular item. Would you please wear our shirt? We'll pay you $7,000 if you wear our shirt in this commercial or this TV program. Or like the deal on TV the other night about the Trans Am, which wasn't selling very good. You know, the General Motors Trans Am, until a show came out. Anybody know what that show was that made it absolutely famous? Smokey and the Bandit. After that show, sky sales skyrocketed because they're all thinking, boy, if I drive a Trans Am, I'm as cool as he was. You know, you watch these TV, these uh, car commercials. They've always got this gorgeous woman standing by the car or sitting in the car. She doesn't come with it, okay? If she did, the payments would be incredibly high. I mean, you think they're high now. <laughs> Wait till you get the payments on one of them and see what they are. Golly. Uh, so <laughs> mixing, mixing something in that really is unrelated. You know, what does this have to do with it? What does smoking have to do with, you know, cowboys? Nothing. Or beer commercials, you know, will often have uh, 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 football or sports. You know, you watch the heavyweight boxing championship of the world. These two giant guys out there slugging up. What's written on the mat right under their feet? <laughs> Budweiser. Or you see some guy racing around the track, Indianapolis 500. He's going 240 miles an hour, thrown on the side of his car. Budweiser. Do you really want that guy full of Budweiser going 240 miles an hour? I mean, think about it, okay? I don't think so. 
This is an example, though, of how you can, you can mix two things together that really don't belong together. And we as Christians have got to be cautious that we really watch out for this kind of thing because Satan is a master liar. And he will get you to believe something that's just simply not true. Many preachers have enormous amounts of truth in their preaching and a few lies associated in there. And you don't ever want to get to the place where you trust everything one particular preacher says because after all, that's my pastor. He'll never lie to me. Look, he might not be intentionally lying, but he might be wrong on some things. Okay? You just listen to what people say. Say, ah, it sounds good. Let me go check that out. Be like a Berean Christian. You know, does, let me go, you know, they listen, but then they search the scriptures. Okay? That would apply to me especially. Don't ever say, well, Hovind said it, therefore it's true. <laughs> well, I hope it is, and I'm working very hard to make it true. And I do a lot of work and research for that reason. But I'm not God. And you better check it out and say, wait, maybe that's not true. So I see people all the time, why do you believe that? Well, that's what my church teaches. Have you looked at what the Bible says? No. Well, I don't care what your church teaches. I don't care what the Pope teaches. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the Mormon bishop teaches. It doesn't matter. What does the book say? Okay. What is written? Now, we talk about Budweiser and all that stuff. You can get video number one for more on that. Now, Proverbs 23. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek the mixed wine. I get some criticism because of my seminar for teaching that you shouldn't even touch or look at any alcohol. In my thinking, that's what these verses teach. You know, you know, you ever, drunks can wake up in the morning after, after they've been drunk and they look down and say, Oh, man, I'm bleeding here. What happened? I don't even remember that. I must have gotten in a fight. I don't even remember what happened. They have wounds without cause. They don't know what caused it. Redness of eyes, babbling. The Bible says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it smooth itself aright. Those, if I understand it correctly, are the signs of fermentation. So don't look at it when it's fermented. There is such a thing as unfermented wine. I was in California at our church out there, and the, the Mr. Guzman, remember Mr. Guzman, Eric? Uh, his wife was the cook at our uh, uh, school. He said, Brother Hovind, would you like some wine? I said, no, brother, I've never tasted it in my life and don't intend to now. He said, no, it's unfermented wine. I said, yeah, right. He showed me the bottle, sure enough, right on there. Unfermented California wine. I said, Interesting. It basically, you know, glorified grape juice. It was really good, but it was, you know, <laughs> grape juice, okay? But they sell it in the stores, unfermented wine. So, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Habakkuk said, Woe to him and giveth his neighbor drink. There are a number of verses. Here they are. You can write them down look them up later. Proverbs, 21, 1, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Isaiah 28, verse 7. Uh, Luke 1, 15. In my thinking, and in minds of many other people too, it is scriptural to simply never drink any. People say, well, Jesus drank wine. Yes, he made it and drank it same day. Could it have been fermented? He can do whatever he wants, okay? But to me, if he was making and drinking fermented wine, he was violating other scriptures, like the Proverbs 23 one we showed you. Uh, so I don't think he would violate scriptures. Now, I've got some good Christian friends who say it's okay to drink wine. All right, well, you do what you want. I think my position, even if nothing else, my position is safer. There is zero chance of a guy like me becoming a drunk. Okay? No drunks ever start off saying, you know, I'm going to become a drunk. I think that'd be awesome. <laughs> Nobody starts off that way. They all start off thinking, one won't hurt me and I can handle it. And most people become drunks or alcoholics. And it's a long time before they realize they are a drunk or an alcoholic. So my advice is just don't ever taste it. I've never tasted any. I had NyQuil a couple times, but, you know, I've never tasted any alcohol. And that stuff tastes terrible. But uh, I've had one kid, several kids have said, well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? And I say, you've got to be kidding. What a dumb way to live your life. I say, have you ever laid your head under a semi-truck? Well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? <laughs> you don't have to try everything to know if it's good or bad. If you're that dumb that you think you've got to learn everything by personal experience, you are not going to live very long, okay? <laughs> Wonder what it feels like to jump off that building. Uh, well, other people have tried it. You can go ahead too if you like, but you'd be smarter to learn from, you know, what happened to them. Uh, 
So the mixing of good and bad together is what happens in our textbooks. And people accuse me of being against science all the time. I'm not against science. I happen to love science. We're in our museum. We have a science center, for heaven's sake. We like science. There's a petrified clam. We have hundreds of these. By the way, I got, Kevin, I got a whole bag of these in my office, if you see me later. We're going to put them some for sale in the bookstore for people, kids. A lot of kids would like to have one of these, take it home. Man, that'd be cool. Petrified clam in the closed position. Well, now, how did that happen? Well, clams, when they die, they open. You can see the ones in the next door in the next room there. Clams, you know, die. As soon as they die, they open up. It's just that's the way it is. The muscle inside relaxes, and they're designed that way. They open up right away. Petrified clams in the closed position. It's a scientific fact. Probably trillions of these exist on the planet. These are found on top of Mount Everest. So we like science, but we think the scientific evidence points to a recent creation and a worldwide flood. To me, the evidence is overwhelming. I don't see how anybody sees it any other way. So no, we're not against science. We have Dinosaur Adventure Land. You're in the middle of it here, tape, doing this taping here at our Dinosaur Adventure Land. We like science. And I think God ought to get the glory for the science that he has produced. The word science means knowledge, okay? And God is the author of all knowledge. And if you haven't, by the way, some of you students here might not have even taken a tour of our Dinosaur Adventure Land. We add stuff all the time. I got to update this, uh, let's see, maybe in the bookstore. Uh, Kevin, can you make a note to ask uh, how, what the total number of visitors we've had this year so far? Uh, we might be crossing over the 60,000 mark since we opened. Our fourth anniversary is uh, this end of this uh, month, October, last of October. But we have lots of visitors. They sit right here in this room where we are now, and they show, uh, we show the little movie about dinosaurs. And we've had a lot of kids get saved, you know, and learn about this. We're not against science. We do science experiments right here. We have our Tesla coil and our... Van de Graaff generator, hundreds of amazing rocks and minerals. Right behind you, there's our gem and mineral some of display, and the ones in here that glow in the dark. How many have ever seen our ones that glow under, under UV light? Have you seen those? A couple have. Oh, that's an amazing display in there. And John, I tell people, John shot the T-Rex and mounted his head on the building here. Uh, how many bullets did it take, John, to kill that thing? Just one. Just one. One shot, one kill. One shot, one kill. You're Marines. Sniper, right? <laughs> yeah. You got to get him in the right spot, okay? Uh, where's the spot on a plastic dinosaur? But uh, <laughs> fiberglass dinosaur. Um, we're not against science. We like science. But I'm against mixing lies with the science. And so what I'm doing in, in our seminar, hopefully, is getting people to realize that even though there's a lot of good science in the seminar, or the homeschool classes, we mentioned you there, Eric. This is my son, Eric, back there, right there, on the right, teaching a homeschool class. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Uh, and I teach homeschool classes. We have a lot of stuff we offer. We teach the kids how to shoot a rubber band. You guys have probably all seen that. We won't take time to do that now. But on um, our super airplanes that make, they go 400 feet. Um, those are impressive. And by the way, also, Kevin, make a note. We're going to speak at that church with 7,500 people uh, the end of October. I would like the girls to make about 2,000 airplanes uh, <laughs> in any spare time they've got. I need a bunch of them. We're not against science, but we're against mixing poison with the science. And what I need to do, I've been threatened to do this for 15 years. I might as well just do it someday. And I was in a debate one time in this house. I'll tell you about that in a minute. They mix the science with the poison and don't even realize it. They jump from science to religion mid-sentence. And I told one guy, I said, now, sir, I want to ask you this question. And when you answer the question, I'm going to listen. I'm not going to interrupt you. But I know you're going to go from science to religion in the middle of the sentence. And just in your answer, I know what your answer is going to be. So when you do, all I'm going to do is raise my hand when you go to religion. This is in a one of the debates I did. And so I asked him the question. He started, he started talking, giving his answer. He says, well, we observe, blah, blah, blah. And therefore, I got my hand ready to go up, and he slowed down. He said, therefore, we believe that... <laughs> And for the, I think probably the first, for the first time in his life, he actually saw it. I am going to religion. We should get one of these textbooks and, you know, highlight yellow for what's real science. And as soon as it turns, you know, mid-sentence becomes religious on science, not supported by evidence. Change it to pink or something with a different highlighter. That'd be a cool project. Just go through. Because there's a lot of good science in the books. But it's thoroughly mixed in with, I think, idiocy. <laughs> stupidity, things that are not science, things that are nonsense for that matter. Like this first grade textbook. It says, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. 
Now this is a dogmatic statement. This is not, you know, we think, we hope, maybe, possibly. This is to a first grader. First graders believe everything you tell them. Now, they believe bananas are moldy spider legs, for heaven's sake, you know. <laughs> so here's a kid, can barely read, and already he's being taught the earth is billions of years old. This is gonna go, this is gonna stick with him for, for the rest of his life unless somebody gets it, digs it, digs this poison out of there, you know. Second grade textbook. Since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. At the bottom it says, life too has evolved on Earth. That word evolved is an extremely tricky word. And I've never seen anybody else do this. I'd have to say this is original with me. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, or good or bad, I don't know. But I have, over the years, really been frustrated by people not defining what they mean by evolution. And I think if our ministry has done anything for the good of the creation cause around the world, this will be it coming up right after the break here. The six different meanings of the word evolution. I've seen other ministries talk about micro and macro, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. I think there's a whole lot more to it than that. And what we'll share with you after the break is, is a very simple way to win every single debate on evolution. I do this in the debates when I've had 93 debates against 100 opponents about. Some of them were three on one or two on one, several of them two on one. So about 100 times I've debated against, uh, I've debated against about 100 evolutionists. You can watch any of them on video. Jonathan, you've seen them all, haven't you? Or is it safe or fair to say that I won all of them? Okay, good. <laughs> I thought so. I mean, I think so. I walk out feeling good. Some of the times they walk out feeling like, boy, I showed him. And, okay, well, but the secret to winning a discussion or a debate on evolution is to define exactly what you're talking about. This is the whole secret right here. What do you mean? When somebody says, do you believe in evolution? What do you mean by that? Because words can have very different meanings. You know, as crazy as Bill Clinton was in his testimony, he was right. There are 18 different definitions of the word is in legal dictionaries. 18 different definitions. And he's a lawyer and knows how to squirm out of anything. And uh, so, uh, what does evolution mean? This will be the key to winning the, any discussion on evolution or any debate. And this is what evolutionists absolutely hate about what my ministry does. Because I, I, if anything, if I can do anything else, I can simplify it down where the average person can understand it. And that's what I want to do. This word evolution, if you define the meaning of the word, the argument's over, you're going to win. We'll come back in a couple minutes and uh, discuss more about what does this word mean and get more into the battery after the break. Dismissed. All right, to me, one of the most critical things you have to in discussion on evolution is finding what you're talking about. You have to be careful with words. Uh, I have, in a sense, all the legal battles we've been fighting here over, over the last four years, learned some words are just incredibly important. Somebody says, where is your residence? Are you a resident of the United States? It's a dangerous word. You've got to be careful answer that. Are you a person? The word person is a dangerous word, believe it or not. Because a person is an artificial corporation created by the state. So when the, 14th, when the uh, Roe versus Wade, you know, the, law, the court case that justifies abortion, they say, that what they said, the court was very careful in how they worded it. They said, the word person, as defined in the 14th Amendment, does not include the unborn. Well, technically that is correct because you don't become a person until you get a birth certificate and receive, be, become a corporation of the state. Now, the question is not, is it a human before it's born? The question was, is it a person before it's born? So somebody was asking the wrong question and the court said, no, it's not a person. And now we've had, what, 50 million babies get murdered justified, falsely justified by that one idea, that it's not a person. So anyway, words can become very important in the meaning of words. So in any document, you can define the word at the beginning of the document and say, okay, for the purposes of this paper, black means white. And then for the rest of that paper, whenever you say the word black, it actually means white because you defined it at the beginning, okay? so. They've defined, you know, person and residence. That's another long, interesting story. But uh, the word evolution has to be defined at the beginning of any discussion of evolution. Someone says, do you believe in evolution? I say, what do you mean? Well, you know, evolution. No, I don't know what you mean. Actually, there are lots of definitions to the word evolution. It's, it's a mathematical term. Evo the word evolution means unrolling, okay? 
So if you had, uh, you know, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, that would be, you could say, the evolution of the multiples of 3 would be an example. Okay? Maybe that's not a good example, but sure. But it, for the purposes of biological evolution discussion, I would say the word evolution has at least six meanings. Uh, you could call it six meanings or six levels or six stages, but six essential steps that it has to go through in order for this theory to be true. The first one is cosmic evolution. That would be the origin of time, space, matter. Now, the evolutionists answer this with the Big Bang. That's their theory. We'll talk about that in a minute. The Bible answers this with Genesis 1.1. We'll get into more of this later, but it's interesting. Time, space, and matter are three components that cannot exist without the other two. The Bible answers it in ten simple words. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, there's matter. Time, space, and matter all came into existence instantaneously. People say, what did God do before the creation? There is no such thing as before the creation because the, the word before implies time and there was no time. God actually started time and space and matter. See, if God's limited by time, He's not God. Time becomes God. So the time, space, matter is called a continuum. Henry Morris has a great article about this in his book, The Long War Against God. Great section, and I forget what page it's on now, but I read that and said, oh, this puts it all together. It makes so much sense. If you had matter, but had no space, where would you put it? If you had matter and space, but had no time, when would you put it? Matter cannot exist if there isn't space. Matter and space cannot exist if there isn't time. So if time stopped, matter and space would have to disappear also. The three are inter, uh, inextricably linked together. Well, the evolutionists try to answer this with the Big Bang. But anyway, that is the first step of evolution. You have, in order to, for evolution to happen, you have to have something to evolve. You know, the matter. And you have to have some place for it to evolve and some time for it to evolve. So the origin of time, space, matter is critical to the evolution theory. The second part is chemical evolution. That's the origin of all the elements from hydrogen. According to the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and possibly some helium. Now what happens, under extreme pressure and temperature, certain elements can fuse together. Just like, John, you do a lot of welding, you know, you get it hot enough, metals will actually melt together, intermingle, become one, okay? You can fuse two hydrogens and become a helium. You have a real serious problem getting some of the other ones. Some are easy to get in fusion, some are very difficult, if not impossible, to get with fusion. See. There are today 92 naturally occurring elements, plus all the synthetic ones, many of which are just, you know, kind of theoretical. They made one, it lasted a microsecond and disappeared. Oh, wow, see, we made one. You know, they fuse something onto uranium and make, a, you know, another one of these higher elements past 92. But basically, I think they have 111 now, if I recall. The number changes all the time. But uh, let me check. Uh, this periodic table here has 100 and three. I believe, if I recall, they're up to 111 now. Uh, and again, I would say probably none of them past 92 exist any place on the earth in any great quantity. I know I could safely say that. Uh, they have existed for a short time and they broke back down to something else. Who cares? But uranium is the last of the naturally occurring elements, element number 92. But anyway, the point is, you got all these elements. Where did they come from? Are we supposed to believe that uranium evolved from hydrogen? See, the evolutionists don't ever talk about this, and I don't think it's fair. I mean, they should be honest, okay? But just be honest. What's the truth about your theory? They talk about carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating. All of the examples we have are examples of an element decaying to a lower number. Uranium decays, reduces in complexity, down to lead eventually. All of them are examples of losing information, not gaining. It is true you can fuse elements in stars, but now you've got a real serious chicken and an egg problem here because you have to have the stars to make the elements and the elements to make the stars. So I had an atheist one time in a debate. Somebody asked the question and he was answering and then I responded. Uh, they said, how did the stars form? You know, how do you get dust to squeeze together to make a solid? And he said, well, it requires enormous energy 
to squeeze all that dust into a solid. Enormous energy in my foot, it's not, not, that's not possible to happen. See, as you try to squeeze dust together, what happens when you squeeze air together in an air compressor? It builds up heat because it wants to get away. It wants to expand. And if you don't give it a really strong container to stay in, it'll blow the lid off of something. Okay, it's compressed in there. That's what a bomb is, you know, rapidly heating something up, <laughs> greatly expanding the, the material. And just, just the shock wave of the bomb, you know, the, what's the name for that? can't believe I forgot that. The concussion, okay, from a bomb can knock things down miles away. Well, fusion can take place. You can fuse things together, but how do you get stars? They, they will say the stars, you know, have enough power and energy to fuse elements, okay? But that doesn't explain how you got the star. Because the stars make the elements, and the elements make the stars. So you have a chicken and an egg problem here. Which one came first? This professor in the debate said, well, we calculated that if 20 stars explode nearby each other, near each other, 20 supernovas, it would create enough energy to form a new star. I said, you have got to be kidding. If you lose 20, you might gain one. I said, you ought to run for Congress, man. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt. <laughs> Which is what they're trying to do, you know. Let's borrow, borrow the money till we get out of debt. Um, that's a losing proposition. I did some calculations one time. This last night, in 2003, they said, they estimated the number of stars in the universe is 70 sextillion. 70 sextillion. If you want to learn a little math here, million has the number 1,000 with one set of zeros after it. So it's a total of six zeros. Just write that down someplace. Million has one extra set of zeros past 1,000. Billion has two extra sets of zeros, like bi for bicycle, okay, or bilateral. Trillion has three sets of zeros plus the original set of zeros, okay. Quadrillion, quintillion, quint, five. Somebody has quintuplets, they have five kids. Quad, you know, quadratraction, quad quadrunner. So you got million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion, septillion. Sex means six, sept means seven. September used to be the seventh month. And October, oct means eight, you know, an octillion, and then novillion, decillion. Uh, October used to be the eighth month until Julius Caesar decided he wanted a month named after him. And guess what they called it? Uh, July, and then Augustus Caesar says, I'd like one named after me, so guess what they called his, you know? August, so we got July and August came in there, messed everything up, so the seventh month is actually, you know, September is the ninth month, but actually sept means seven. Who cares about all that stuff? I do, okay, so that's why I brought it up. But anyway, um, how do we get off on all that? You got <laughs> all this uh, fusion, you got the stars have to make the elements, and the elements to make the stars, it just becomes a real serious problem. They say there are 70 sextillion stars that would be six sets of zeros plus the original thousand. So seven times three, 21 zeros. Now they're telling us the universe is 20 billion years old. Now that's big. Some say, oh no, it's only 14.65 like Hugh Ross, you know, like, like he knows the date and everything else. Uh, but, uh, 70 sextillion divided by 20 billion gives you about six and a half million stars per minute. The universe would have to get seven, six and a half million new stars every minute for 20 billion years in order to have the number that we currently have. No one has ever seen one star forming, not one has ever been observed. Here's a Science Magazine back in 86. They said, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is, we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. There is not even a good theory for star formation, and there is absolutely zero observable evidence. That's critical now, because we've never seen a star form. They don't even know how they could. All we've observed, and science deals with what we observe, okay? What we see, what we test, what we can demonstrate. We've observed stars blowing up. It's called a nova. Or if it's a big one, it's called a supernova, okay?
By the way, the word Nova in Spanish means won't go. So when Chevy introduced the Chevy Nova, it didn't sell very well in Mexico. <laughs> you want to buy a Nova? Uh -uh. <laughs> I want a car that goes. I don't want one that doesn't go. Who cares? Anyway, we see stars blow up. It's, by the way, it's also very interesting. A Nova or a supernova or it makes a ring <coughs> as it you know, blows up, and this thing drifts off into space. But it, it, it's been observed that about every 30 years, a new supernova ring is discovered. Let's assume that the scientists are correct in saying that we have a star exploding every 30 years. It appears that the logic is right and the science is right that when a star burns out a certain amount of its mass, it will you know, explode. It collapses and then explodes and then collapses back. It goes through a series of things you can study in astronomy class. But first it swells up. How many of you have ever roasted a marshmallow on the fire? You know, it gets to a certain temperature and and if you get it just right and stop right there, it's nice golden brown. You wait another half a second and poof, a little flaming black bunch of charcoal that nobody wants to eat or the Dennis Menace wants to fling on somebody's face. But uh, the uh, st stars, they reach a certain critical mass where they no longer have the gravity to hold themselves together because they're burning off their gravity, right, their fuel, which is you know, burning off their mass, and then whoosh, they swell up. It appears that the sun is, I don't know how close, uh, close, uh, reasonably close to, to the point where it's going to swell up before it collapses into a nova or supernova. Well, the Bible says, you know, the Bible says God will scorch men with fervent heat. That may or may not be when it happens. I don't know. Uh, somebody said, do you believe in global warming? I said, oh, yeah, you should read Revelation. You know, God's going to scorch men with fervent heat. <laughs> global warming is really going to take place that day. Uh, so the, the Hubble telescope was searching through, they're cataloging supernovas. So far they found less than 300. Now wait a minute. If a star blows up every, you know, 30 years, and we can only find, you know, less than 300 supernova rings, that's only 9,000 years worth. If the universe is billions of years old, shouldn't there be a whole lot more of these out there? So what we've observed is stars blowing up. What they predict is stars will be forming. I've had atheists tell me, oh, Hoven, you're lying. We see stars forming right now in Horsehead Nebula or Crab Nebula, whatever, you know. And they've got several spots. We'll cover that more on video 7 about 12 years from now. But uh, on video 7, you can get, we, they talk about stars are forming. They'll even say in textbooks, you know, stars are constantly being formed in star nurseries. And they'll point to a spot in the, in this cloud of dust, and they'll point to a picture they took of that same cloud, you know, two years ago, and say, see, the spot is getting brighter. Okay, yeah, you can see it. I mean, it's getting brighter. They got a good point there. They'll say, don't you see? That's a star forming. I see, guys, if this was evidence you're going to use in a court of law, they'd laugh at you, okay? We're not seeing a star forming. You could be seeing the dust clearing, and there's a star behind the dust that's just showing through now. You could be seeing a supernova in the middle of that dust cloud. You don't know that a star is forming. Nobody's ever seen a star form. We have no evidence of it, of it happening and no theory how it could happen. So, last estimate was there's enough stars that everybody on Earth, if you divide the population of 6 billion people into the number of stars, every one of you could own 11 trillion stars to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. There's an awful lot of stars out there. We've never seen one form. Okay, number four, organic evolution, the origin of life. This is another meaning of the word. You have cosmic, chemical, stellar, and planetary, by the way, would be number three. Number four is organic evolution. Let's suppose we give them the first three. You say, okay, there was a big bang, nothing exploded, and produced everything. Okay, we'll give you that. Then this hydrogen formed itself into other atoms and became, you know, your, uh, Helium and lithium and on and on up the chain. It became finally uranium. Okay, we'll give you all that too. We'll see it happen. I don't believe it, but let's say it did. Then this, these elements have to get together and make stars. We've never seen it happen, but I'm going to give you stars. We'll start from there. Now you have to get this non-living, well, it's not really dead because it was never alive, but we'll call it dead, okay? We get this dead matter has to organize itself into a living system. 
organic evolution, origin of life. Where is the evidence for this happening? They can't even make it happen when they try in the laboratory. There's certainly no evidence that it happened by itself in nature. Organic evolution. This is a major problem. We cover this a lot more in video four. Absolutely no evidence for this happening at all. I was the very first debate I did. I don't know if you were you there, Eric, for that one. University of West Florida, Dr. Pruitt out there. Um, one of the students, I believe it was that one, or I don't know, I've done so many universities speaking, but one of the students at one of the universities out, I think it was out there, he said, Mr. Hoven, what if scientists make life in the laboratory? What are you going to say then? I said, well, first of all, I would like to point out they are, they are a long ways from it. They're not even close to making life in the laboratory. Nowhere close. He said, well, yeah, you're right. I said, but if a bunch of intelligent scientists work really hard and spend a lot of your money and my money to produce life in the laboratory, I guess that would prove that it takes intelligence to make life, wouldn't it? <laughs> Shut him right up. That's all it would prove. It would just help prove that it takes intelligence to make life. Of course, in their mind, if a bunch of scientists put billions of dollars into things and finally are able to produce life, in their mind, that's enough to demonstrate that it could have happened in nature over billions of years. Well, I could probably get people to arrange a thousand quarters where they're all heads. Probably, I could probably do that. But that doesn't mean it could happen by chance by flipping quarters. You know, chances of that, getting a thousand of them in a row, all heads, I would say is close enough to zero you can forget it. Fifthly, macroevolution. This is where an animal changes to another kind of animal. And I use the word kind deliberately. I think you'd be wise if you're going to do anything on creation, and most of you taking this class are doing it because you want to do something more effectively on creation, you know, be an evangelist or soul winner or something. Use the word kind. Don't get trapped into using the word species. That's another one of those words you've got to watch, like, you know, person or <laughs> something like that. Charles Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species. And here's what happened. In Darwin's time, People were arguing that if there are 14 varieties of finches on these islands, then God created 14 varieties of finches. They had a doctrine, they called it back then, it was called fixidity of the species. That was stupid. It is not true that if there's 14 kinds of, you know, finches, that God made 14 kinds of finches. The Bible teaches no such thing, but some people, in their zeal to defend the Bible, had gone beyond what the Bible teaches. And People do this all the time, you know. The Bible says, you know, men should not have long hair. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11, 14. So then somebody else comes along and says, well, I'm going to define what that means. And here's, you know, can't be touching your ears, can't be touching your collar. Well, that's the kind of haircut I have, you know, obviously, and that's what I've done for years and years. You can look at any of my pictures from high school on. But the Bible doesn't say that. So they've kind of added to the Word of God. The Bible says women should dress modestly. I agree. So then they say, okay, because of that, here's my rules. You know, you have to wear this, this, this. You can't wear this, this, this. But all it says is dress modestly, be feminine, let them decide from there. Um, so the word kind here is you have to define what you mean by that. And Darwin changed it to the word species. And some of the Christians of his day, I think it was obviously totally wrong what they were doing. They were trying to defend the Bible, but they ended up making it worse. And I'm an independent, temperamental, fundamental Baptist, and I'll be the first one to say probably the fundamental Baptists have done enormous damage to the cause of Christ by all of their dumb rules and regulations they've added to what the Bible teaches. And there were some fundamentalists back in Darwin's day <coughs> that were teaching <coughs> a doctrine called fixidity, F-I-X-I-D-I-T-Y, fixidity, anyway, it's fixed, okay, of the species. Dangerous, dangerous doctrine. They said, well, look, we got dogs and wolves and coyotes, so God must have made them all three. Nothing changes. They probably thought they were doing the world a favor by teaching this, but they were not, okay? They were teaching a false doctrine, a heresy. Darwin, very correctly, <clears throat> rebelled against that. Darwin raised pigeons. He was a strange man in many, many ways, okay? He loved to shoot anything. He'd go out hunting just for the sake of killing something, you know. He was not your conservationist, that's for sure. And he especially loved to shoot birds. No telling how many thousand birds Darwin shot. 
One of the reasons he shot them, he liked to shoot, but also he collected them, and also he liked worms. He just was a strange guy. He really enjoyed worms, and he thought it was kind of mean for the birds to eat the worms, so he said, oh, I'm going to shoot some of the birds so they eat less worms, whatever. But the people were teaching, you know, if there's 14 varieties of finches, then God created each variety for that particular island. Darwin said, no, I don't believe that. And he was, he was right. The people of his day, the fundamentalists, were wrong to teach that. So then Darwin took this false doctrine they were teaching, rebelled against it correctly, and went way overboard on the other side and said, well, no, not only are these 14 finches related, this proves finches are related to bananas and pineapples. That's, we'll get into more of that later, that's dumb. But macroevolution tells us animals change from one kind into another. And I'd be, I would caution you in any debate or discussion, don't use the word species unless you carefully define what you're talking about. I've asked evolutionists all lots of times, I said, could you please tell me what a species is? Nobody's ever given a good hard definition for species. Anybody know one? Different variety of a kind? Variety of a kind. We've got three words here, species, variety, and kind. You've got to define your terms here. Are dog and a wolf different species? They are. Canis lupus, Canis domesticus. Now they're the same genus, you know, if you know your classification, King Philip came over for Girl Scouts, okay? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. King Philip came over for Girl Scouts. We'll get you the first letter. We won't get you all of it. I like what you did today, Diane. That was good. She learned a way to know the capital of every single state instantly. Pick a state. I'll tell you the capital. A. the capital of every state. That, she pulled that one on me today. <laughs> Isn't that the capital of Alaska? A? Capital A? Okay. <laughs> I fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker to it. Okay. But uh, why don't we go off on that? K kind, okay? Stick with the word kind and you'll be safe, okay? Ten times in the first chapter in Genesis, it says, they will bring forth after their kind. It does not say they will bring forth after their species. And some of the new Bible perversions have changed it to say species. Boy, are they asking for trouble in an argument, okay? It's kinds that's important, not species. Changing one kind or another. I do this in the seminar. I say, look, there's 400 recognized varieties of dogs today. American Dog Kennel Association, whatever they call that thing, will say there are 400 recognized varieties of dogs. Now keep in mind, in between all those, there's a bazillion varieties of mutt. But that's the recognized breeds. And most of them will say, all the dogs had a common ancestor. And I would quickly agree. I believe they did. Looked like a dog. I had a lady come to a seminar one time. She said, Mr. Hoven, our family has been involved in dog breeding and kennels for four generations. For 100 years, we have been raising and developing varieties of dogs and keeping them for people and taking care of them and selling them and fixing them and all that kind of stuff, whatever you do to a dog. And she said, we are convinced after just 100 years of observation that you could give us 20 or 30, I believe she said, generic mutts. You go pick out any mutts you want. Let us selectively breed them for 100 years and we will produce for you a Great Dane and a Chihuahua and everything in between. We could reproduce every single breed on the planet in 100 years. Most of the breeds of dogs, if you stop and think about it, have been developed by man for some particular reason. You know, some person wants a dog to chase the weasel down the hole, so they keep looking for a dog with shorter legs, you know, and pretty soon they end up with a dachshund, you know, half a dog high and dog and a half long. And it'll chase the weasel down the hole and do really good. Others want something that runs like the wind, you know, so they develop, you know, the fastest, longest legged, you know, biggest lungs, etc., and they end up with a greyhound or whatever. Or somebody wants one that's able to pull your sled through the snow. So they want one that's really strong and, and you know, short legs and, and big muscles and, you know, you know, long hair can handle the, you know, they get a husky. But if you think about it, nearly all of the dogs in the world today would not survive if it weren't for human intervention. How long would the chihuahuas last? Just turn them loose into the woods. <laughs> it wouldn't last one day, okay? By the next morning, they'd all be dead. 
Certainly by the next two mornings they'd all be dead. Um, the dogs, certainly there are varieties of dogs. Big dogs, little dogs, no question. And they probably had a common ancestor. Probably even the dog, the wolf, the coyote. I don't know how far that goes. Jonathan, what's the Hebrew word for that? Barim, is that? Um, uh, kind? Barameen. There's a, what's the website that deals with barmenology or? How do you, do you know how to spell that? B A R A M I N. Let me get this on tape here. B A R A M I N. Bearman? Bearmean? B A R A M I N. Yeah. B A R A M I N is the Hebrew word for kind. And there are some scientists who are working on trying to calculate what were the original kinds. I think that's good research. Is a horse and a zebra the same kind of animal? Probably. Is a horse and a dog the same kind of animal? Probably not. Is a lion and a tiger the same kind of animal? Now there's an interesting one. I don't know. Maybe so. It's certainly they're obviously different from a turtle. I mean that I can tell you, you know. But if you took every variety of animal on the planet and got a bunch of five-year-olds, they could classify them by kind and probably get 99% of them right. Just, it's just obvious. Is a hawk and an eagle the same kind? Now, I don't know. That's a good question, too. Honestly, I don't know. I know that a hawk and a banana are not the same kind. Now, that one I know, okay. <laughs> and you got to watch it. You can watch any of my debates. These guys are doing that all the time, trying to say, well, what's a kind? Well, the Bible says if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Can a horse and a zebra bring forth? Yeah. It's called a zorse. Is the offspring fertile? Sometimes. Usually not. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if the offspring is fertile. Did they bring forth? Yes, they did. Okay, then they're the same kind. Okay. Are you ever going to be able to crossbreed a horse and a pine tree? You know? No. Okay. It's never going to happen. So it seems to me like the biblical term kind indicates those that originally were able to bring forth. And you can listen to the debates. I'm trying to be cautious when I answer the question, you know. I say those that originally could bring forth. 6,000 years ago, rabbits brought forth rabbits. And then they brought forth more rabbits and more rabbits. That's a good illustration because they bring forth a lot of rabbits. Anyway, so at some point, they probably diversified to where now we have Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits that can no longer interbreed. They won't. Are they the same kind? Quite obviously. It's a rabbit, you know. Did they start off as an original parent stock? Yeah, probably. It probably was a rabbit, would be my guess. Okay. Now, is that evidence that rabbits and, you know, bananas are related? No. I do this all the time with kids in the seminars. I'll say, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? And I'll get some five-year-old kid. Do you do this, Eric? Get some five-year-old kid. Uh, the banana. I've had them say, you know, I have two of them now have said, uh, the boy. i got to cover up the boy, okay? Uh, a child can tell you, it's, you know, the wolf, the dog, and the coyote are the same kind. I had one last week say the coyote. I don't understand. Of course, his parents are poking him. No, no, no. Idiot. Think about my son. How dumb can you be? You know? <laughs> it's not the, not the coyote. Um, I guess because his face is in the wrong way or something. You get the art department to draw one face in the other way. Maybe that'll solve the problem. But uh, the Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind ten times. It says that first book, Ch Charlie Darwin writes a book, The Origin of Species. The Christians didn't catch it. By the way, the Christians didn't catch what the Supreme Court did either when they said the word person does not include the unborn. They didn't catch it. Judge, are you saying this is not a human? Are you saying this is not alive? Oh, I didn't say that. I said it's not a person. Okay, thank you, Judge. Just wanted to make sure. They didn't catch it. I guess I've learned from uh, School of Hard Knocks the last seven years to be just watch the words, okay? Are you the person responsible? I'm not sure what a person is, sir. Can you define that for me, you know? Uh, that's another long, interesting story. But anyway, how many of you saw the article we passed out to the staff about are you a person? Did you guys get that? Anybody still have that? I don't know where I put mine, but... Uh, can you get that for me, Dan? I want to make a copy. No. Sometime, if you can get that. The last meaning of the word evolution 
is the word microevolution. Now, the evolutionists object to us dividing this into these six terms. They even object to dividing it into two terms. They don't like you to divide it into micro and macro. But I came up with the six meanings of the word evolution, which I think is much more clear and concise. Exactly what do you mean by evolution? Microevolution is variations within the kinds. And again, I'm choosing my words very carefully. Variations happen, but it stays within the boundary called kind. Exactly what is a kind? Those that are able to bring forth. The horse, the zebra, the ass, the possibly the quagga. I'm not exactly sure how many varieties of horse-like animals today have a common ancestor. It's a good question. We've got a display up in the second floor of the Science Center. There are eight varieties of bears in the world today. Panda bear, brown bear, sun bear, grizzly bear, uh, uh, Black bear, uh, the Alaskan, the white one, uh, polar bear. What's the other one? Uh, panda bear. Seven. One more. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Do they have a common ancestor? Probably so. People say, you think a polar bear is related to a panda bear? Uh, probably. I don't know. There's a whole lot of similarities. Now, that's quite a variety. I understand. Great Dane and Chihuahua is quite a variety, too. They're still infertile, by the way, except for a few mechanical problems. But uh, the polar bear, great, and you know, all these other bears probably had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue that they probably did, but that doesn't prove bears are related, you know, to pine trees. And if you stay, if you're going to get into a discussion on evolution, I would have this chart handy in your PowerPoint or whatever you're using, so you can constantly be referring back to it. Because here's what happens in school: they give the kids thousands of examples of number six and try to make them believe that they've proven the whole theory. Not a good idea. The first five are purely religious. They are not scientific. Only number six is actually science. And I happen to agree with number six. So when somebody says, do you believe in evolution? I say, well, that depends what you mean. They say, well, you know, things change. Yep, I agree. You know, variations happen. Oh, yeah, I agree. Well, you know, you look different than your grandparents. Yep, I agree. My grandpa parted his hair in the middle. I look different. You can look at his pictures, though. I do look an awful lot like my grandpa, Ole, Ole Espinus from Norway. What was the entire title of Darwin's book? The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. We'll get into that much later here, but... The origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Um, did I have it back there? Just, only, this only has part of the title, The Origin of Species, but actually it's a whole lot longer title. It was common in the 1800s to have really long titles to books. Um, we cover much more about the meaning of the word evolution on video four, but I just really would encourage everybody, if you're going to get into a discussion or debate or whatever, you be sure to keep constantly referring back to this. Because they will give you examples by the thousands of number six and say, don't you see that proves evolution? Here's what happened. When you discuss evolution with somebody, if you don't define the word, you're going to talk right past each other. Because when they say the word evolution, they are thinking of number six, you know, all these variations. They say, man, why can't you see it? They really get frustrated, uh, right, rightfully so. They say, don't you see it? It's just, it's obvious. Evolution's all around us. We see it happening everywhere. They're thinking of number six. <coughs> but I'm thinking of number five or four or three, and I don't see how they do see it. And so if you don't keep this, constantly referring to this, you're going to lose the debate or discussion because you've got to define the term. Okay. The teachers are told in their teacher's manuals, got about four more minutes here, be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. One of the things that is essential to evolution theory is billions of years. We've got a caller calls into the radio program quite often. And I, I tell him, I said, you realize, of course, you know, because he'll argue about, you know, because I'll say something about the earth is only 6,000 years old, and he'll say, no, it's billions of years old, and here's my reasons. I say, well, we can discuss this, you know, carbon dating, potassium argon dating, whatever. But you understand, this age of the earth issue is only the first 
of many, many hurdles you've got to jump over. I mean, if there are 20 doors between you and the pot of gold, and you can't get through the first one, you're stopped. If you get through the first one, you still got to get through the second one, okay? And then the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. And, uh, but there are many hurdles to evolution being true. The first one is the age of the earth. So the teachers are taught, tell your first graders, the earth is billions of years old. Stress it. Make sure everybody believes it. And then tell it to the second graders, and tell it to the third graders, and the fourth graders. Every year, over and over. Here we have this book right here. In the time of the dinosaurs. What's the first sentence in the book say, Kevin? Millions of years ago, there were no people in the world, but there were dinosaurs. Millions of years ago. Now here's a kid who can barely read, or can't read at all, you know, three-year-old, and mom's reading him the story at night, you know. This kid's getting this in his head from the time he's three or two or, you know, four, millions of years ago. And they automatically associate dinosaurs with millions of years ago. I spoke to a class one to a school one time. There were 300 first graders in the room. Great big school, and they had just first grade, second grade, third grade in this massive school building. So they gave me all the first graders. Try that sometime. 300 first graders. Just try that. Okay. I got in there, got all my dinosaurs out, you know, and the kids are all, oh, looking at the dinosaurs, you know. And teachers are all, shh, quiet, Johnny, sit down, quit pulling Susie's hair, blah, blah, blah. I said, hey, boys and girls, I got a question. When did dinosaurs live? Instantly. I mean, it wasn't a half second. All of them burst out millions of years ago. Here these kids can barely read. Public school, probably some of them couldn't read at all. And they, know, they, they believe dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. What are we doing? Stressed. How old is the earth? They start, is stressed from before they can read that the earth is millions of years old. Now, science deals with things we can observe, study, and test. You can look up definition of science. Jonathan, you've seen this in quite a few different dictionaries. What's dictionary.com say about science? Do you remember that one? About science? You didn't look that one up? The word science comes from the word seer in, I think it's French, which means to know. What do we know? Not what do we think. What do we know? Well, if you're not going to be able to know everything, you're going to have to trust what somebody else knows based on their observation. So some definitions have been set. This is kind of the... Standard definition, systemized knowledge, systemized, organized, put together. We have things that we know about rocks. We have things that we know about, you know, animals. We have things that we know about wind. We have things that we know about clouds. You can systemize or classify, classi uh, classify the knowledge. <coughs> and you can study all of the knowledge man has ever gained about clouds. <coughs> and a lot of information has been gathered about clouds. And a lot of information has been gathered about rocks and minerals. And we've got a bunch around here. Systemized knowledge derived, where did we get this knowledge from? We got it from observation, study, etc. Definition from Webster's Dif Dictionary. Is science, is evolution <coughs> science? What do we observe? What do we test? What do we see? And the answer is, we don't observe any of it. It's purely a religion, something they have to believe. So we'll get into next week the first law of thermodynamics and second law. There are actually three laws of thermodynamics. I don't remember the third one, so it doesn't, must not be important, but uh, it's rarely used. <coughs> but the uh, first, second laws of thermodynamics absolutely, totally destroy the possibility of evolution even being true. It's not possible for it to happen. We'll get into all those next week. The first and second laws of thermodynamics. Any questions so far? All right. Next week, bring somebody with you. Come to class. See you then. Thank you. For more information on other materials offered by Creation Science Evangelism, call us at 850-479-DINO. That's 850-479-3466. Or visit us online at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.